Um, John 11, chapter 40 says this. Did I not say that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Amen. Simple. We don't have to Greek and Hebrew and, and analyze and theorize that word believe. Jesus was standing in a situation facing death when everyone around him saw death and loss and heartache. And they couldn't see the other side of the tomb. And you know where I'm going with this, but we'll, let's take a journey together. But Jesus stood there and he said, all you have to do is believe. I said you're going to see the glory of God. And I believe, you know the whole thing about the cloud of glory in the Old Testament? I believe we are going to be part of that cloud of glory. But we're not going to take it into the church. We're going to take it out there. Amen. We're going to carry the presence of God wherever we go. Because when you begin to see Jesus the way he really is, the one, we talk about revival. We remember things that happened. We share our testimonies. We see healings, don't we? You all do. I know you all do. We see miracles. We see people get raised from the dead. Jesus was the great revivalist, the great reviver. You know, I looked up the, the, the meaning of the, um, the word revive, and it's all those great things about bringing back to life. Uh, you know, bring, I'm not going to read it to you. Getting an expectancy again, getting excited about something, and something that was dead back to life again. Jesus carried that, that power within him. And do you know that you carry the same power today? And some of us, because we've been stuck in that place of disappointment and, and certain things we're going to look at, we haven't been able to release that revival power. And now I love hearing the stories um, of how God, Steve said it yesterday, how, how God messes with our minds when he does something like using a four-year-old to pray for healing. When we've tried it, you know, We've got all our church things together, and we do our prayer meetings, which we have to do. You know, church is important, okay? But when God steps in and uses somebody who we think, they're not qualified for this. If you were here yesterday, I was asked a question, how do you remain humble? And I thought, how do I answer this? Am I humble enough? Or, you know, it's a difficult question. But you know how I remain humble? When I stand on the platform and I see the faces of people looking at me like you are today, and I'm standing here representing Jesus, the great reviver, because that's the noun of the word revive. The noun is reviver. You know, the operative word and the breed of genera the generation, the breed of believer today are people who are going to be so passionate for Jesus. You know, we think we are, but when we experience him messing with our minds and stepping into a room where we think we've got our 10 steps to victory together, and now he's going to do it, and then Jesus steps in, and he does something. We don't expect Jesus to step out of a fire and appear in front of Muslims who are not even calling on him, and he steps out of a fire and they get saved. We can't make that happen. And one of the keys today to walking in revival and continuing in revival is recognizing we can't make it happen. But it's God's plan. And all he wants for us is to get to the place where we say, I recognize I can't do it without you. So turn to John 11 if you'd like. And I'm going to try and do this. How much time would you say I have, Greg? Because I don't want to overstep because I want you to invite me back. <laughs> oh, okay, by 11. Um, okay, I've just got to do something very quickly before we get into John 11. For this is the kingdom of heaven. Please buy it. It's a really good book. Okay, I wrote it. Um, they're out there in the front. No, really, okay, this is something God put on my heart, and maybe you'll get some of it out of my message today, but even though what I'm speaking about isn't in the book. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And to be poor in spirit means we're going to recognize that we can't do it without him. He's waiting for us to cooperate with him, but we can't make it happen. We need to get with his agenda, with his plan, and recognize that he's the one who steps in and he gives us the invitation. The kingdom of heaven is not a place we're going to when we die. The kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's close by. 
And there are certain things available to you and I that we have access to when we get to the place where we say, okay, God, I know it's not me. It's all about you. And so you've got to read the book to find out. The other one is, and it's 200 rand. And as Rory says, well worth the money. Um, this other one is um, Rory and I put together a prophetic school equipping manual. And it's, there are 36 chapters in here of things that we've learned over a long period of time. Even though we're so young, it's a, been a long period of time that we've learned some things and we've put some things in here that you can learn from, but it won't make you a prophet, okay? You gotta know that it's 300 Rand. And um, it's, you know, when we teach at prophetic schools, we, we have our notes and things, so you will read it and get some good information and we believe you'll get an impartation as well as you go through that prophetic school manual. But it's basically our notes. We've kept some of the real secrets behind because if we give it all to you, you won't want to do prophetic school. Okay, I just got to be honest with you. Okay, so this is what I'm talking to you about. John chapter 11. I'm not going to read through, but just keep your Bible open in case I say something and you disagree with me because now I've got half an hour to give this message. And listen quickly. Okay. You're going to listen quickly. John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus. You all know this. Who doesn't know that Lazarus died? So you all know that Lazarus died and he was raised again. But we find different types of people in John chapter 11 who were faced with this terrible situation of somebody getting sick to the point of death and actually dying. And it tells me that Mary and Martha were the two sisters involved. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And if you go and read in Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 11, I could be wrong. Um, these were the two sisters who Jesus was in their house. And Martha was the one who was serving and she was busy doing everything. It says she was distracted with much serving. And Mary was the one who was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Okay, so we have two different types of personalities here, but we also have two different types of churches that we're going to look at because you are all leaders here. This is an equipping time for leaders. So we're going to look at it from both points of view. If it fits you as an individual, I want you to take it. If it fits you as a church leader, I want you to take it. The Martha type of person is the person who is so busy. Martha actually went to Jesus in the house in the book of Luke, and she says, in other words, typical female, she says, I'm the one who has to do all the work here. I'm the one who's got to prepare everything, and I'm missing out on the good stuff. You know what I mean? If you're a woman with a small baby, and all you do is you spend your life in the cry room, and you're the one crying, not the baby. You know what I mean? So here, Martha had this kind of attitude, and she was saying to, she went to Jesus and she said, it's not fair that I've got to do all of this stuff and all my sister does is sit at your feet. And Jesus' response to this was, it's okay. I'm giving you my paraphrase. It's okay. Mary's chosen the good thing. Okay. It's good to sit at the feet of Jesus, isn't it? But sometimes things have to be done. So Martha was the one. Martha and Mary sent a message to Jesus he was outside of town. He was somewhere else. And they send a message to Jesus saying, the one whom you love is sick. You know, they sent him an SMS or a WhatsApp and they said, he's, he's sick. Please, you've got to get your fast. They, their expectation was Jesus was going to come, hear the, t the report of this person he loved, and he was going to get there as fast as possible because they called for him. Mary was the one who fits into the category of the extravagant worshiper. Mary was the one, as you know, who sat at the feet of Jesus in that house. But then it also tells me later on, after Lazarus has been raised from the dead, that Mary was the one who went into the house that Jesus was visiting and she broke the alabaster flask of perfume or oil on the feet of Jesus and dried his feet with her hair. To me, that speaks of somebody who's extravagant in their worship for Jesus. She was a risk taker because she went into that house doing something that was unexpected. And not, people were not accustomed to a woman coming in and just breaking open a flask, even today. You know, you don't just break open your best perfume on the feet of, of a visitor and dry you know, with your hair. So she was a risk taker. 
She was willing to push through the opinions of other people and just reveal her worship and her love for Jesus. And there are people in churches like that today who they want to get into the presence of God. And you know, worship is not singing slow songs. Worship is laying down your life for Jesus. It's giving you all for him. It's his priority being higher than anything else. And you will give your life. You know, there's people who come to the front and they say, I surrender all. And they don't know what God's going to ask him to surrender. But in that moment, they say, I surrender all. That's the Mary type. So these two sisters send the message. And the strange thing to me is that Jesus gets the message. And then he decides to stay where he is for a bit longer. And I think, how rude is that? He's got this message. Surely he should have packed his bags, booked the next flight, and got to wherever Lazarus was. But do you know that Jesus knew the end of the story? Which is why he could stand and say, he said, this, is, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. That scripture has driven me nuts for a while. Maybe you could pray for me later. Um, because that scripture is taken out of context so many times. Jesus could only, you know, we are not put into sickness for the glory of God. The healing is for the glory of God. But people turn it around and they say, God's allowing me to be sick so he can get the glory out of this rubbish. Some of you don't agree. I don't see anyone waving pom-poms when I say that. So there are people, you know, Jesus said that because he knew the end of the story. He knew the glory was going to be revealed. The goodness of God is the glory of God being revealed. So he stayed a few more days. Then when they finally arrive... First of all, the disciples, when he heard, when they heard that Jesus was going to go back to where Lazarus was, they tried to stop him. And they said, because they knew the opposition that had been there before. They knew that people in that place that Lazarus and his two sisters were, were trying to take Jesus out. And so they warned him and they said, in other words, why are you looking for trouble? You know, sometimes when you're contending for something, the people around you who haven't heard what you've heard or seen what you've seen are going to warn you and try and hold you back. And sometimes wisdom comes across, you know. It's fear that comes across as wisdom. So be very careful that people around you are on the same page as you. When you want to contend for your territory, when you want to trust God for your healing that you heard about today, there are going to be people who are going to say, but you know, Sister Susie tried this before. Sister Mary had this problem before, and she stood up in front of the church before, and every single person prophesied she was going to get healed, but look what happened to her. Don't listen to those voices when God has said, your previous experience is what shouts louder than anything else in the middle of a battle, and the previous experience of others is going to be this loud voice saying, we've tried it before, you can't do it. It's not only the enemy who tells you that you can't get what God has said to you. Normally, it's people around you who haven't heard what you've heard. You've got to be, if you're going to decide that you're going to contend for revival, you're going to have to be focused on what God has said. And you're going to have to have a reference point in your battle where you can turn around and say, but God said. If you don't have that reference point... If you cannot say, God said, you have nothing to stand on. And then you're going to be like Mary and Martha. Mary was the first one who arrived. They were sitting in a house and people had come from the different areas to comfort them because by now Lazarus had died. I mean, what kind of situation is this where we feel all our hope is in Jesus just to come and heal Lazarus? We don't know what was wrong with him back in those days. Maybe the biblical, the theologians do, but I don't. All I know, he was sick. So he died. Now Mary, Martha, the doer, Martha, was the first one who got out of that house. She ran to meet Jesus on the road and she said to him, if you were not here, my brother would not have died. Now this is a very interesting situation because Jesus starts to have a conversation with Martha, the doer. And I want to say to you, we need to do things. Faith without works is dead. But if we're doing things out of a need for acceptance or a feeling that we have to perform to get God to raise our situation, 
If we feel that we always have to say yes to everything to get God to move, we're in a bad place because this is what's going to happen. You're going to live with disappointment because people will always disappoint you. And there are people sitting with this kind of syndrome on their lives because they've never had acceptance from authority figures. And so they've got this syndrome on their lives that the dangerous ones are the ones who say, yes, I'll do it. And then they go home and they have a big fat moan because they don't know what they signed up to do. They just said yes in the moment. You've got to say yes when God says yes. You've got to obey the word. God is not looking for you to run around to do things to please him. He's looking for your obedience to simple instructions. God is not complicated. He's not a slave driver and he's not a hard task master. We're supposed to be doing what God has given us to do and functioning in that and flowing in that so we see results. So Martha gets to Jesus. So, you know, if you were here, it, wa it was half accusing. You know, we sent you this message a few days ago and you were late. Now Lazarus has died. This is the end of the situation. Now. I'm, you know how you feel when you feel that you've done everything you can do where you feel that you've given all your money and you don't see the harvest, where you feel that you prophesied to everybody in the room, but what about me? And I know there's some people here who, who've been in this place. You're disappointed because you feel, I've done everything for God. I've been obedient. I've stepped over the chicken line. I've trusted you for the big things. But why is my situation still dead? And here we're talking about revival. So Martha has this conversation with Jesus, and Jesus says a few things to her. And if you go read in John 11, which I'm not going to turn to now, he says some things to her. Did you not know this? Did, he asks her some questions, and out of her mouth comes the perfect answers. She doesn't take a step wrong or say a wrong word. She says, I know that you can do it. I know that you're the resurrection and the life. You know, do you know those people? Maybe they aren't here today, but maybe someone you know that when they can say all the right words, they can quote the scripture better than you can. And you've been in ministry for 35 or 40 years. And these people can quote the scriptures. But when something goes wrong, they're quoting it out of an empty heart because it hasn't been revelation. They haven't met the great reviver. They've just heard about him. And they've read the word and they've done done the prayer meeting and done the teamwork and the evangelism, but it's been out of an empty heart without a revelation or an encounter of who the great reviver is. You know, the churches who are struggling around the world, there are church leaders who are discouraged and hopeless and feeling as if the people talk about revival, a great awakening where great things are going to happen, and they think, how is it going to happen for me? You know, people up here who preach don't have it all together. Maybe that's just me and the rest of the preachers have it all together, you know. But people need to meet on a consistent and constant basis to have an encounter with the great reviver, Jesus himself. So he, this is Martha's story. Then Martha, the doer, the make it happen kind of person, goes back to the house and says to Mary... Jesus is looking for you. He never asked for Mary. But if you read that, you'll find out. He didn't say, please go and fetch Mary. But Martha was this kind of person who, I'm going to make this happen. We're going to get this thing to work. So she sent Mary. But one of the reasons that she sent Mary was because she knew that Mary was the one who had sat at the feet of Jesus. She thought, I'm so desperate now. I've done everything I know to do. And I think I'm a type of doer person where I like things to be done properly. I like to have routine. Maybe a little bit of German in me, Robert. I like things to be, you know, routine. And I want things to be done in order. And if it doesn't happen and I don't know what to do to help it next, and I'm not talking about helping God, if I don't know what to do to get this plan to work next, I become a bit frustrated. Martha had got to this place. Where she said, okay, I've done it. I've even been to Jesus. I've quoted the word. I've told him that he's the resurrection and the life. And still here I am. Now let me get somebody else who may have a different key to me, which was Mary. Who was Mary? So Mary was sitting in the house. This is the first key. 
that some of you may be sitting in this place where you've sacrificed your life, or you think you have, for Jesus. You've been the person up front here with your hands the highest, and you jumped up and down during the praise and worship. You're the person who prophesies at every prayer meeting about the goodness of God, but deep in your heart, you realize that you're still waiting for God to come and step into your life and do what you need him to do. You're the one who's been the risk taker. And you said, I'm going to do this in spite of the opposition I see. But still, you need Jesus to step into that area in your life that needs to be revived. Mary heard that Jesus had come to town. She didn't get up off that chair or wherever she was sitting. She stayed in the house. And you know what this tells me? She was offended with Jesus. She was the one who had loved him sacrificed, waited, heard, heard, hung on his every word. And he never turned up when he needed to be there for her. So she stayed in the house. She was disappointed. She was offended. And I know some of you are getting this. She was sitting there saying, where was he when I needed him? So when Mary, when Martha returned to the house and whispered, it says she secretly came to Mary and said, Jesus is asking for you. She got up and she moved to where Jesus was. But the reason I know that she wasn't in the house worshiping Jesus, you know, on her knees, praying to God in heaven, saying, please, I need you to come, declaring these great prophetic words that Lazarus come forth. She wasn't doing that. Because when she got up to leave the house, the people who had come from the different areas thought that she had got up and run to mourn at the grave of Lazarus. So they could see her behavior. But she gets to Jesus on the road and she says exactly the same thing as Martha. She says, if you had been, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, there's some people who need, we all need to be these extravagant worshipers where nothing is going to hold us back. We all need to be the people who are serving and doing and busy about the things of God that he's given us to do. But if you're sitting in that place in that house and you're saying, but God, it always seems to be Greg and Hensia who get, their, who get prophecies, you know. It always seems to be Rory who gets invitations to minister. It always seems to be Brother Joe Soap who gets the opportunity to do this and do that. And what about me? You've got to recognize this morning that that is the stone that's sitting in front of your vision. That is the big stone and the big stumbling block. And it's just sitting there because you haven't dealt with maybe the offense in your heart or the disappointment in your heart because you think Jesus never turned up when he needed to. And you might be the person saying, Jesus, if you were here when I needed you, my father wouldn't have died. I was there myself. I said those words to God. I'm not, I'm not taking this out of it. someone else's story. I said those very same words. If you were here, I sacrificed my life. I was a Mary. I traveled to the nation. Sometimes I left my kids behind. But where were you when I needed you to heal my dad? And I had to get over that offense that I built in my heart towards God and that disappointment because I thought, I could help God how to do it. And all he was saying, take your hands off. When he says, if you, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'd see the glory of God? All we have to do is believe that he wants to do it. So Jesus has, Mary comes, and here's this extravagant, you know the extravagant worship is the dramatic type of person. You know what I'm talking about? Some of us, I said this to Sally, during worship, I don't know if you've noticed, South Africans are very reserved. Some of us, on the inside, we're going, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, aren't we? We are, or is it just me? On the inside. On the outside, we've got it all together. Sally just oozes. She doesn't care. Hallelujah. She's shouting and cheering God. But, you know, Mary was the, I could see Sally a little bit like the Mary. She ran and fell at the feet of Jesus. She just let it all hang out. And so Jesus saw that in her, and that got a response from Jesus. He saw her weeping. And this is the scripture that every single believer can quote. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. 
I'm sure you can quote that. No, have you ever been to those Bible quizzes where they say, what, what does John 11, uh, John 11, 35 say? Jesus wept. I want to tell you, Jesus stood in front of that crowd and he stood in front of that tomb knowing that the person he loved was on the other side of that tomb. Some of you today, Jesus, if not all of you, and I'm preaching to myself, I have things that I need to be moved out of the way. I have situations that I'm praying about that need to be revived. I have longings and desires and promises in my heart that came from God that only he can make happen. And so Jesus stood there and he wept. But then it also says, he looked at this crowd and he was indignant. There's a translation that says, he snorted with indignation. I can't show you how to snort. I can't do it. But you know what I mean. Think of a horse. Think of a horse. I'm not going to give it a try. Um, it won't be pretty. But, um, and I'm representing women today. So, you know, Jesus stood there. It says he was troubled. He was agitated. He wasn't troubled because Lazarus had died. He was mad at the enemy right there, which is why he was indignant. You know what it means to be indignant? You've had enough. You're not going to put up with this anymore, and something has to change. God wants some of you to become indignant today with the enemy. And so Jesus stood there, and he snorted with indignation. And that's when he said, Lazarus, come forth. He said, remove that tomb. Get that, that stone away. Not the tomb. Thank you, Rory. Um, <laughs> bless you, brother. Um, you know, he said... Remove that stone. Take that stone away. But you know Martha's response right there. She says, he's been in there for four days. He stinks by now. This is the doer. This is the let's make this happen kind of person. In the middle of her biggest test of all, she doesn't say, okay, now we're going to do it. She says, I still can't get this thing right. I can't understand it. He's going to stink in there. And the old King James says, he stinketh. Doesn't it sound... It sounds so much more spiritual <laughs> when you say, when you add E-T-H on the end. So here, the, you, know, you all know this, the, the stone gets rolled away and Jesus says in this voice, Lazarus, come forth. Because he wouldn't have said, if he was so mad at the enemy in that moment, he wouldn't have said, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. You know, he shouted that, he said, Lazarus. Come forth. And he probably said it louder than I have, but I'm protecting my throat. He shouted at the enemy. And you know, we are so focused on, let's get people out of the tomb. Let's get the grave clothes off. You know, we've got to remember that there was a big flipping stone in front of Lazarus for him to come out. And we've got to focus on what is it that has to be removed out of the way. The grave clothes can take care of themselves. The miracle was the stone being removed. Now, I want you to see the grace of God in your situation. Whether you're a Mary or a Martha, it doesn't matter to him today. Whether you're the one who's been striving to make it happen, and you've been telling God how he needs to do it. You know, God, I think, I see that there's, I'm disappointed because you never turned up two days ago, and I see this obstacle in the way, and I think if you did this, it would make it so much easier and so much quicker. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for you to get your hands off. Because as much as you're mad at the enemy, Jesus is madder than you are at the enemy. There's so many people, you know, Jesus, the new thing is not a new thing. Maybe this is a, a secret for all you prophetic people. We like to talk about a new thing. It's a new season. God's doing a new thing. But do you know in the, in the New Testament, it doesn't talk about a new thing. Jesus is the new thing that happened at the cross. Isaiah 43 says, forget the old things, the former things. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Isaiah 35 talks about, is a prophetic word about Jesus. The lame are going to walk. The deaf are going to hear. The 
the blind are going to see. Go, go read Isaiah 35, because I now have four minutes left. Jesus at the cross was the new thing that happened. In your valley, where the table's being prepared before you in the presence of your enemies, the cross is the table that was prepared 2,000 years ago. Now, you've got to get hold of that revelation, and you've got to say, Jesus is my reviver. And in spite of who you are, the Mary, the Martha, the skeptical people who stood there when they saw Jesus weeping, and they said, if this person who can cause the blind eyes to open, if he could do that, what's the problem? Because they, d they didn't understand why he was weeping. It was his compassion. They didn't understand it. So whether you're a skeptical today, a skeptic today, a Mary, a Martha, or a disciple who's going to warn people and say, rather be wise. Don't contend for that territory. Revival is a whole lot of nonsense. Why are you even trusting for that? In spite of all of those attitudes, there's the grace of God. That's the, the greatest thing of all. That in one moment, he can do, he can do this, and your attitude changes. I, there, was, there was a real presence of God this morning during the worship. It's very rare that I want to sit and just bawl my eyes out in worship. And I, I felt the waves of the presence of God. Now, this is what revival is. It starts here. But we've got to take it out. We, I, think, I don't even have to say this stuff because we heard it this week. We've got to walk in it. We've got to be open to it. And, you know, instead of sitting in, in a meeting where God starts to move and the whole program gets shifted around, uh, where Kurt gets up and starts prophesying to Hensia and Greg, and then other people just join in. And instead of saying, but what about the program? What about the time? We're going to need lunch at half past 12. Forget lunch. Let's eat what God puts on the table before us today. And that's his grace and his goodness. I've got two minutes. I'm going to take full advantage of two minutes. Is that okay? Did I hear an alarm go off somewhere? I'm going to read, I'm going to read two scriptures to you very quickly. Two scriptures. Um, people are passionate about the things of God, especially when we talk about revival. You're all passionate. You want to see the dead get raised, don't you? Thank you for that. I didn't see the pom-poms going up. You want to prophesy to people in the marketplace. You want to write books. You want to travel to the nations. You want to plant, your, plant churches. You want to plant churches and all of that stuff. This is what happens when you try to speak quickly. Um, you know, great, great passion has to be worked, not worshipped. And you know what we've done in church? We worship our passion. We say, I'm so passionate about this thing. We need to be working our passion. And just as much as I'm talking about Martha being the doer, make it happen, if God's put a passion inside of you for something, that's what's going to keep you towards the intended result. You've got to get your passion going. We talk about ignite and revive. What's your passion? What is it that God put inside your heart? And it might not be to travel to the nations. It might be to touch your next door neighbor in a good way, in a Christian way. Okay. Um, just hear what I'm saying. <laughs> It might be to minister to your next door neighbor. Okay, you heard what I said. One minute. Let me read my scriptures quickly. <laughs> Repent right now for where are your minds? Your minds are in the gutter. There are people sitting here with internal frustration. And you know what that internal frustration is? When your old season collides with the new. That internal frustration is a passion that's rising up inside of you and pushing you forward so that you will not give up and you'll keep contending for the revival that God's given you in your sphere of authority. You're supposed to take revival to work on Monday. You're supposed to take revival home to your unsaved husband today, not five years from now, because you carry it within you. Now, let me read my scriptures. It's 11 o'clock. Um, oh. I've got to find it. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Jesus defeated the enemy at the cross. He was mad because he knew, standing in front of the tomb of Lazarus, what he was going to do. And the enemy was still trying his best to stop everything. It says, are you being dead in your trespasses? No, I'm not actually going to read it. I'll read the very end and you can read it at home. It says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He wants to do that in your situation today. 
He did it at the cross. He wants you to step into it today. And here's the last one. I promise it's the last one. This to me is one of the amazing things in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 to 26, when we get together to have communion. We get our little shot glasses. Sometimes it's wine. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's grape juice. Depending on the church you're in, it's going to be grape juice. Um, and then we get our little crackers that everybody gets solemn and serious. And we crunch our cracker as quietly as possible so as not to offend the person next to us. And then we all do it down our shot glasses. But do you know, it's a time of celebration. Because Jesus said, I won't even read it to you, but he said, when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He wasn't saying, get all solemn and sad because I died on the cross and I really suffered on the cross. He was saying, remember what I did, what I paid for, how I dealt with the enemy on your behalf, how I spoke to the tomb and I got it open for you, how I made access for you so you could step into a great awakening and you can experience a great outpouring like never before. It happened at the cross.